Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. As always, we are honored and welcome to uh, honored to have and welcome in our fellow affiliate and sponsorship, Andy Sheckman, CEO of Miles Franklin, with well over 30 years in the precious metals business and a family owned operation as well. He's going to be gracious enough to answer some uh, difficult but important questions that we have regarding the wealth transfer and all the financial mechanisms per usual. As always, if you're new to the podcast, please do like, subscribe, and share so we can grow the channel. Mr. Sheckman, how are you doing today, brother? John, I'm good, my man. Thanks for having me, buddy. You're, you're right. I mean, there is no shortage of things to talk about. That's, uh, that's for sure. It's uh, kind of spinning a little faster since the last time we talked. Indeed. And I think the tempest is going to increase over the next couple of months. So, uh, yeah. Well, before we get started, I want to, uh, I promised your lovely wife, Shauna, that I would uh, do this. So I'm, uh, thanks to Shauna. She has given us some swag as a affiliate sponsor, Miles Franklin. She was nice enough to send along this hat and uh, t-shirt. So I hope everybody can, uh, can see that. And so uh, she was nice enough to send me that yesterday. So we're, we're very I've gotten a lot of, a lot of feedback about that when I wear <laughs> uh, we have that one and one that says triple digit silver and a lot of people comment about it i had no idea how many <laughs> it's um i think they're cool so i'm glad thanks for showing that and, oh yeah uh, you never know maybe we'll actually start making some of those and 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 putting them on our website because a lot of people yeah. like in live streams i do they're like i want one of those i want one of those send me one of those so totally. we sent a lot of them out only suggestion i have if it's okay is maybe do a white background with gold because the black is hot as heck right now, but other yeah. than that, it's great. <laughs> Ain't that the truth? Living here in Southern Florida, I know all about that. I don't envy you, man. I've been, I have family there, you know, so I, I know a thing or two about Give that. Give it another few months and it's some of the best weather in the world. Yeah. But uh, yeah, May, June, July, August, boy, it can be hot. Get ready to lose weight at a radical pace. <laughs> right. Well, let's get started as we always do, brother. So let's dive right in and uh, make the best use of your time and our audience respectively. So um, first question, Andy, is, as you know, uh, something significant happened last week with uh, an investment we both have, and that's uh, XRP, finally won their long-anticipated case against the SEC with a $125 million settlement from Judge Torres. Now that they're finally breaking free, we're just waiting for the SEC to admit that they're not going to appeal it, which we know they're not going to do. It's just a formality. Um, do you, Would you agree that this begins the opening of the proverbial safety valve for the new digital financial system? Yeah, I think it's certainly, I mean, I think the safety valve is, is already been open, but I think mm -hmm. this certainly gives, gives it uh, maybe uh, an acceleration. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, and I think it, it will help maybe accelerate the acceptance and the understanding of what, what a fast moving, um, very transparent uh, system has to offer living in a world that is archaic, that is very costly, that is very slow moving, where you send a wire uh, at, at 2.30 on a, Friday, on a Friday and you miss the cutoff and you don't get it until, you know, late Monday morning and all of the things that are associated with this archaic system of ours that has kind of run its course yeah i think it it would be uh it would be certainly a boost to to a new system that is desperately needed yeah absolutely and you no know, you're right i think i should have rephrased that in the sense that yeah i think the door is already wide open i think this just further as you said earlier accelerates the process because it is going to be the backbone for uh, the blockchain and all of these different currencies and mechanisms that we're anticipating it will move it in such a expedite way because I always laugh when they say the Swiss system because it's it's anything but <laughs> as you as you mentioned um, so as we've discussed many times uh, previously Andy we see central banks buying gold hand over fist we know that that's a hedge against the inevitable death of the dollar we've established that but one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about Andy um, that I think is an, an overarching point to this context is would you also consider acknowledging the fact that another reason for this might be that the central bank is buying gold as well to, you know, back their currencies for the revaluation that's incoming. hundred um, percent. There's no question about it. First of all, to the first point, you know, last year, 2023, for the first two quarters, first six months of the year, central banks bought more gold than any time in history in the first six months of any year. Well, that was only bettered by this first six months. 
Mm. Um, and the amount of gold that they're all accumulating is at a record pace never seen before. Um, and, you know, there was misinformation that the Chinese had stopped buying gold. And I had said on every show I was on that that's not true. There's no way that they stopped buying. They're just doing it through proxy banks. There's their their sent uh, commercial banks are buying it on behalf of the PBOC very privately from refineries in South Africa and Switzerland. They're not disclosing that to to the IMF. And lo and behold, all of the movement of of gold for the PBOC is is held or moved by the controlled by the commercial banks and the import export records show that they didn't stop buying. They just told the market they did. They lowered the premium mm -hmm. on the Shanghai Exchange to 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 enhance that illusion and just look at the West is so stupid the price falls and it enabled them to accumulate a lot at, at subsidized prices. But you know, why would they want to tell us how much gold do they really own? Why would they want to be honest about it? My whole career, everyone said China is underreporting their numbers. They stayed at 1,200 forever, 1,200 tons forever. And yet they're the largest producers in the world of it. Um, they've been producing between three and 500 tons a year for forever. And so their numbers, uh, by many estimates, are north of 40,000 metric tons. And we only have 8,000 metric tons, 8,300 supposedly, and we're the world's largest. They're the world's largest producer and the world's largest importer. And they would have every right in the world to not be as open as, you know, even the head of the IMF came out the other day and said they're way under reporting what they own, as did the lead analyst for the Bank of Montreal. But look at the United States. When was the last time we audited Fort Knox? It was uh, it was supposed to be audited uh, twice, or there was a bill by Ron Paul to do so, and both times it was voted down. Why? It's the, it's the people's gold. And so I would say that if we indeed are going to revalue gold, which I believe it will, in fact, it's held in every central bank's account in an account called the revaluation account. That's the name of it on the balance sheet of every central bank. And gentleman, uh, head of the Dutch National Bank, keeps talking about this, that we should revalue gold. And, you know, by the way, there was just a, um, this Bitcoin meeting in, in Tennessee mm -hmm. where Trump spoke, talking about national, uh, having a national, uh, uh, a strategic Bitcoin reserve. Well, right after he got off the stage, Senator Loomis from Wyoming came, got up and said, I agree, this is what we want to do. And I've drafted a bill to partially fund this strategic Bitcoin reserve, and there is a bill number, I don't know where it's gone, but she said to do so by revaluing part of the Federal Reserve's gold. And so when you talk about, you know, where did Gaddafi's gold go? Where did Hussein's gold go? Where did the 12 billion in gold that the Ukrainians sold for, to fight uh, the war, for their war efforts, where did that gold go? So um, my, my point is, is that don't believe the numbers that anyone says, whether it's the United States or China, if indeed they're going to revalue gold, then they are using the suppression of the Western paper price to accumulate it. And we're seeing that all around the globe. In fact, China is the second largest producer of, of silver in the world. And I've validated on two interviews I've done in the last week with mining executives, silver mining executives, who are saying China is going all around Latin America, buying all the silver dore and silver concentrate, paying two to three times what the West will pay for it and shipping it home and refining it there because it didn't come off of an exchange. It doesn't reflect the price and it doesn't, you have no idea how much they got. And so they're going to great efforts, great lengths to hide as a, are all the central banks, including ours. So yes, if a revaluation is in the cards, which in my soul, I believe it will be largely in part because we've already heard that the new unit settlement currency that Delma Rousseff, the head of the BRICS New Development Bank, former president of Brazil has already said in principle, we have agreed to it. There will be a meeting in September in China to ratify it with intentions of rolling out in October. Gold is taking on a new role. And I think indeed for those central banks who now are buying it faster than any time in central bank history in over 100 years, um, using the suppression to run cover for it, why would they want anyone to know how much they actually do hold if indeed it gives them a seat at the table by how much they do hold? And by letting everyone know how much they're acquiring and repatriating, all that really does is, is incentivize everyone else to take a closer look at something that has gone unnoticed for far too long. Yeah, no, completely. Thank you for um, acknowledging and articulating on that, which actually sets up my next question. You kind of alluded to it. We have the BRICS summit coming up in Russia sometime in October. I think it's around this time where they've got roughly 100 nations, 78% of the population. 
I had asked some other subject matter experts on this, and I wanted to get your take as a fellow affiliate and sponsor. Um, with everything that we just discussed, Andy, with XRP, with the central banks acquiring gold, to your point, um, would you would it be fair to say that October's BRICS meeting is more of a formality of the inevitable layout of the gold standard being you know ferreted out between all those respective countries and their currencies, and just the gold a repatriation, to your point, as an overarching move against the dollar? I don't know if it's a formality or not, because there were a lot of people who thought they would issue one in South Africa last year. Mm -hmm. They came out of that meeting, said all the countries will trade with one another in their local currencies. And we're seeing that where China's buying oil or, or oil from Saudi Arabia, paying for it in digital yuan, which is then immediately convertible into gold on the Shanghai Gold Exchange. Russia and India are trading rubles and rupee. Uh, China's buying corn and soybeans from Brazil using yuan and, and again, convertible into gold. So all of these things used to settle in dollars, but they tasked the finance ministers into going back to the drawing board and coming back to the meeting in October. Maybe it is. But one thing J James Rickard said that really stuck with me was that they will issue some form of common settlement currency, but the best time to do it is when you have mass adoption, more countries ratifying onto the, the BRICS agenda, the BRICS group, and and 59 countries. There was a meeting in, in Novograd uh, just a few weeks ago that coincided with the G7 meeting in Italy, which, by the way, the crown prince declined an invitation to the G7 and oh. sent his finance ministers to the BRICS meeting. 59 countries say they have want to have formally applied. We don't know which ones will be accepted, but his point was that it's much easier to trade with 60 or 70 countries, which represent the majority of human population, than it is with you know nine or 10 countries. Uh, you have more options in using a common settlement currency. So maybe it is. I think it certainly is a high possibility. I don't know that I would call it a formality. What I would call a formality is ultimately gold being used as a peg to a new system or part of a new system, part of a reset. The question is, do they announce it in October or not? And that is something that I wouldn't quite call a formality. I would say there is a high probability of it, but mm -hmm. it surprised a lot of people that they, they didn't announce this in Johannesburg last year. So uh, I think it's coming, whether it happens now or so shortly thereafter remains to be seen. But Formality in the respect that it will happen, yes. Um, not a formality in my mind as to it for sure happening in October because Lord knows that the world is spinning so massively out of control right now that a lot can happen between now and then just, you know, just for, just to disrupt uh, what the best laid plans already are. Yeah, I, I think that that's a certainty that we're going to see a lot of uh, shifting and volatility, ultimately for the better, but but as part of the, the, uh, the landing process, maybe maybe the better word I could have used was inevitability of it rather than formality. But I think you, you understood what I meant. But again, thank you for addressing that. Another good uh, question, Andy, to ask that's, I think, fairly apropos of the upcoming BRICS meeting is uh, a country that we need to continually keep our eye on the radar, which I'm sure you do, which is Japan. Um, my understanding was there was a recent stock market sell-off due to the Japan interest rate hike. Could you explain a little bit about the carry trade to our viewers and what actually precipitated the sell-off? The carry trade is, in essence, borrowing in a cheap currency, a la the yen, which has been very cheap and with interest rates at or near zero, and taking the proceeds and investing in another currency and an instrument within that currency that pays a higher return, like the U.S. Treasury is paying 5% at six-month treasuries and capturing that spread. And and the way that these are levered up, if if interest rates in the United States fall or or the yen strengthens or rates in Japan strengthen, then it it can create a margin call, and that's mm -hmm. exactly what has happened. And it just goes to show to me what it really goes to show is how fragile the entire ecosystem is. I mean, we go back to the United States in 2019, we tried to. Uh, to enact austerity and raise rates a little bit, and you, you incite the repo market crisis. So we back off and pivot and go back to lowering rates. And you look at what happened in the United Kingdom. They tried to, to initiate austerity and raise rates, and they blew up their pensions. So they had to back off and go back to pivoting. Now you look at what's happened here in the United States. We try to, to enact austerity and raise rates to 5%, albeit, you know, uh, 500 basis point increase in a year is pretty aggressive, but we raise rates to five 
percent in the 10-year treasury and everything starts to break silicon and signature and all of these banks so we back off and now we want to pivot again and you look at japan all they wanted to do is raise rates just a little bit after being zero bound for decades and and let their yen strengthen just a little bit and it starts to break stock markets across the globe singapore and, and saudi i mean uh, south korea and the united states and just goes to show the problem that is created through messing with mother nature and interest rates. And when you suppress interest rates, you create distortions, not only in asset prices, but misallocation of resource and capital, which further distorts asset prices. Mother nature will have her way. And, and mother nature is waiting around the interest rate increase corner. Raise rates, here I am, time to pay the piper. And they, oh, oh, oh no, and they run the other way. Right. And, and that's, it just goes to show that we are trapped. The whole Western system is trapped. Too much debt created at too low of interest rates, try to raise the interest rates and you have a big problem, whether it be in Japan, whether it be in the United States, whether it be in the United Kingdom, or whether it be in the European Union, the whole system. This is why you talk about a reset. It's needed. We have we have really squandered um, monetary policy, fiscal irresponsibility, creating massive, massive problems in asset prices that need to find equilibrium with with real interest rates and if interest rates rise the whole system blows apart so that's really what has happened and of course you have the japanese minister back back off sorry sorry we won't we won't raise them we'll we'll, we'll sit out you know we're sorry and and things there's calm for a week but what it says to me is that we have not even begun to see the problems and it goes to show how fragile the system is whether it be all of these western systems hanging on an edge or an eighth of an inch separating calm and chaos, relative calm, uh, with President Trump almost being shot. That's how close we are. We're right on the teetering on on the on the edge of a knife, or you know, an eighth of an inch. That's not a market that inspires confidence, in my opinion. If if anything moves the wrong way, the whole system breaks. That should be warning for you to to get out of harm's way, to be a contrarian and not be a victim. Because I think if you're not, you're bound to be one. And uh, unconventional times, if you will, my man, call for unconventional thought and action. Agreed. We, in, other, in, or, in order to have what you want, you have to do what you've never done and take, uh, as you said, proactive steps accordingly, which I think both of our respective audiences have been actively doing them. And prayerfully, they will continue to do that. Those, like you said, if you haven't yet, what are you waiting for, as you've always said? Um, speaking of uh, the interest rates, <laughs> our wonderfully fraudulent Federal Reserve System, which we know is being changed, uh, I think they're pricing in, or they have already the rate cut, uh, I think it's September 18th or 19th, somewhere in that range, um, half a percent or half a basis point. Um, I guess the question would be, Andy, in your estimation of history of this whole thing, looking at economic shifts and so forth, would you think that if they, they cut that in September a half a percent, is that enough to send the market over or is it going to take a couple more rate cuts to do that? It would take, I mean, it's it would be bullish for the stock market in essence and, and bullish for the price of gold. Uh, this is the, the problem that we're in, you know. Uh, yeah, Jeremy Siegel come out and beg for an emergency Fed meeting and, and to drop rates by 150 basis points. But wouldn't that just unwind the carry trade even more as you're lowering rates? It's the same thing as raising the yen, one or the other. It's in teeter-totter. So uh, we have chosen inflation over austerity forever, and this is no difference. And when you lower those interest rates, yeah, you're benefiting the very wealthy because you are creating more inflation and the very wealthy, it's not that their bank accounts go up and the currency that's being inflated away, but the wealthy own assets and asset prices go higher in a low interest rate environment because they become worth more. The cost of money is, is less. Um, and this is the problem that we've gotten into, the distortions that were created through abnormally low interest rates. So is a 50 basis point cut enough? I don't know. Probably not. Uh, it would certainly move the needle, but uh, I think that, you know, we'd still be at four and a half percent or whatnot. I think you're, there are people wanting to see this move down below four and, and get below that and and go the same path. We never learn our, our lesson. It's like a forest fire, right? You, It's a very terrible thing to see what happens to the forest and all the creatures within it, but you come back a few years later and it's stronger than ever. In 2008, at the great financial crisis, the Federal Reserve's balance sheet was 800 billion. A year ago, it was 9 trillion. 
And so everyone who says, if you just would have left your money in the market, you would have been all right. So selling would have been stupid. Yeah, that's true. But what would it look like if the Fed not come in and added $8 trillion in bond purchases, which suppress interest rates in both mortgage-backed securities and treasuries, which created incredible distortions in asset prices and misallocations in resource and capital, where a hedge fund can go buy it next to nothing, borrow money next to nothing, and then go buy 7,000 houses across America and do them as a hedge fund in an Airbnb program. What did that do to res residential real estate? And it's a lot more than 7,000. It's more like probably 700,000. And, and what, is it, what does it do for equity prices where corporations can borrow money at next to nothing and buy back their shares in the open market to make their stock price go up and enrich the executives, get higher bonuses to go and borrow money and buy equities, to buy Bitcoin, to buy whatever it is at next to nothing. It's the same principle of the carry trade, borrow in the yen at next to nothing and buy assets in the U.S. earning a whole lot more, whether it be NVIDIA or 5% treasuries or whatever the hell that it is. As long as the yen doesn't go against you or the rates in the U.S. or because it doesn't have to be treasuries. It could be tech stocks, Apple, could be Bitcoin, could be anything. Point as long as those don't go against you, it's a very profitable trade. But this is the problem. We never learn. We should let the rates go to where they should be and let these companies fail and stop intervening and stop bailing them out and let Mother Nature have her pound of flesh so that we can get on with healing and moving forward because it's an endless cycle of lowering interest rates and, and messing with Mother Nature and distorting prices. But you know, all of this at the expense of the, the fact that we have close to $11 trillion that needs to, to, to be funded in treasuries, either selling treasuries or, or paying for the treasuries that are coming due. For the next foreseeable future, up to 2030, we have to come up and finance 11 trillion in treasuries minimum for the next six years, just to, to, to keep the lights on and to pay what we already owe. What if no one wants to hold our treasuries anymore because we've chosen to follow the path of lowering rates, inflating the currency, destroying the value of the currency you're accumulating? And when you add into it the weaponization of the treasury market, where we just stole five trillion in Russian assets to to buy weapons from the military industrial complex to give to the Ukraine, the country in a war against that country we stole it from. These are lines you don't come back from. So the the one thing that no one's really factoring into the equation is that treasuries are worth the confidence of the country behind it that is losing confidence, not only in its monetary policy, its fiscal irresponsibility, where we're creating $100,000 of debt per second, 24 seven, that's a trillion every 100 days. It took 200 years to do it the first time, we're doing it in 100 days or less. Now, so you're inflating your currency, you're weaponizing your treasury market and your country's a mess elections and borders and lawlessness and judicial system, all of these things factor into the willingness of the rest of the world to hold our treasuries or say, no, thank you. I'll buy gold, which has doubled the performance of the 10-year treasury for 25 years with no counterparty liability. So yes, they can try and lower rates and kick the can down the road like they've been doing forever, but at some point, no one wants the can anymore. People say, we've chosen a different can and it's gold and it's it's XRP, it's Bitcoin, it's it's oil, it's okay. silver, it's rare earths, it's tangibles, it's commodities, it's Bretton Woods 3, a system that will be about transparency and commodities, says Zoltan Pozar, and I believe it. So yeah, I think that this is a very sip, slippery slope we're on, John, where you're you're caught, you're trapped between inflation and austerity, the same same trap central bankers have been caught in since the beginning of time. And this is why you need gold. Um, because for 180 years, when we were on the gold standard, we had no inflation. Contrary to the beliefs of ignorant people who say you can't run a country that uh, on a gold standard, they, that's just central bank speak. We had no inflation and the greatest amount of prosperity the world has ever seen. Um, it, it's the mismanagement of the reserve currency of the central banks, the inflation and the misery that comes along with it. And all of the distortions that Mother Nature will be waiting for her pound of flesh, and she'll get it by hook or crook. Don't know if that's tomorrow. Don't know if it's, you know, a couple tomorrows down the road, but it's coming. And this is why you get out of the way, not just to uh, own gold to make money. You, you, you buy gold because it is money. And the biggest money in the world, the central banks are showing you that by their actions, by buying more than any time in, in the last hundred plus years. And, and this, 
is increasing. The first six months of this year was the most gold central banks have ever bought, only bettering the last six months. How many more times do I need to talk about central bank gold buying before people really get it, that these aren't just the wealthiest people, they are the insiders, they know the playbook. And that's why they're doing it. They don't do it just for giggles, they do it because they know they must reposition ahead of whatever development comes. Absolutely, and, and to your point, Andy, um... I think the, the mother nature reset or however you want to call it, uh, I think BRICS is sort of establishing the fact that they're going to do it by hook or crook. They're going to induce that by just wholly moving away from the dollar. And they've been, as you said, incrementally doing that all along. We're just coming into the inevitability of, of the, the optics of it now. Uh, so I know that you live in Florida, um, but I wanted to ask you, is there a place in the U.S. that uses, that you know of, gold and silver as money? I ask because I've heard that Utah has some favorable laws for it as legal tender. Do you know if that's the case or maybe there's uh, you know, still some outstanding issues in making gold and silver? I mean, the law issues. says you can't force a shopkeeper to take it. If someone wants to in, in the 11 states that I believe have embraced that, you can. You can go pay your property taxes in it in those states, but you can't go into Walmart and say, well, I want you to take this gold. Well, we're not set up for that, but you could go into a tire repair shop and I'm bringing my car into your shop, John. And, and you're like, yeah, I, I'd be more than happy to take gold. Well, great. It's legal tender. Um, so it's, it's law that says it is, it is legal to use this for all debts, public and private in these States. I think there's 11 of them, Utah and Texas and Oklahoma and, and others. And, and, you know, but you can't make someone take it. So it's in its very infantile stages. I look at it as a, as the American spirit, to be honest with you, pushing back the, you know, the, the resistance, if you will, the, the, um, the, the rogue resistance pushing back against the brain dead monetary policy of the fed and the horrendous irresponsible fiscal policy of, of the treasury to give the constituents of these states the ability to, you know, not be devastated by by inflation and by what could happen, give them an out. So it it gives me a glimmer of hope. But yeah, it's a it's a there's as many as 20 states all in that have that have it in front of or have, you know, proposals in front of the legislature or in front of the legislature already or or have already enacted it. So yeah, it's very small, but it is growing and um I think it'll be something that a trend that will continue. Yeah. And hopefully that gap will continue to widen with time here as these other, you know, events we talked about precipitate. Um, gold seemed to hold up pretty well here over the past two weeks. Obviously, I think today was at over 2,500, if I'm not mistaken, something like that. Uh, but silver has been kind of lagging back a little bit. Is this more of a seasonal thing, lack of spending by India and China, a geopolitical thing, or is it something else entirely? Um, it's something else entirely. And am I able to share my screen with you? I'll make that happen. Let me, uh, I'll explain to you all right now what's going on. Okay. Go ahead. You have the, oops. I think I need to give me, let me see if I can do this. Yeah. It's disabled. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll need to drop that on you, but I can show no, you. No, no, it's fine. It's fine. Uh, Try right, it. Here we go. Try it now. Does Tell me work? if you can see that. Can you see I can that? See, I can. Yes. Go All ahead. right. We're going to start on this one. Right. This is a, a presentation I gave uh, at the Rules Symposium. So let me do this. Let me do Please. play from current slide. All right. We want to go back. No, that's right. All right. Can you see this? I sure can. All right. This is, and you can Google um, October 14th, 1942, Subcommittee on Banking and Currency, United States Senate, S.2768, a bill to authorize the use for war purposes of silver held or owned by the United States. Now, this was in 1942. The present consumption of silver for war purposes is at the rate of about 100,000 ounces a year and is growing rapidly. According to the War Production Board, it is only a matter of months before war demands will increase sufficiently to require at least 200 million ounces of silver a year for war, right? And that's 1942. Now, I would think it's safe to say I've given speeches two in a row, one, both of them in Vancouver two years ago, where I said there's 500 ounces of silver in a Tomahawk cruise missile. 
And a man comes up to me after my presentation and he says, you know, I work for the Department of Defense. I'm a consultant. I helped design the Tomahawk. I know there's some silver in it. I don't know how much. I'll get back to you. I gave the speech again this year in Vancouver in January at the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference, an amazing show, one of only two that I speak at um, because I choose to. Um, and I gave a different speech and that guy was there again. And he came up to me and he said, you know, you're right. And he showed me a whole stack of pictures, uh, a stack of pictures. Now, don't get rid of this screen yet because I got some more to show you. But he says, uh, you're right, there is between 13 and 14 kilograms in, in the tip of a tomahawk. And he was showing me all these pictures of how, you know, they had trouble shooting it vertically. And they had this platform off the coast of California. He was showing me the pictures. He said it was designed to come out of, an, of a tube of a, of a torpedo tube of a submarine. But, we, you know, this and that. And this is all declassified, he says, so don't worry. But he says, you're right. There is definitely between 13 and 14 kilograms of silver in a Tomahawk cruise missile. Well, think of all the missiles and all the guns and all the arrows or bullets in aerospace and, and submarines and all of these high tech, you know, uh, stealth bombers. They all need copious amounts of silver. In 1942, they needed 200 million ounces a year. What is it today? So let's keep going. All right. This is the, the numbers out of the Silver Institute. Look at the demand side. First of all, in terms of deficit, a 265 million ounce deficit between supply and demand. They want us to believe right here that um, industrial demands take 9%, electrical and electronics 9%, of which photovoltaics, that's uh, uh, solar panels, 20%, brazing and alloys. Oops, whoop, want to go back there. Hang on, let's go back. I want. I was talking to a, a guy yesterday who was a, uh, he's a mechanic for um, United Airlines. He's retired, and he said there's so much silver soldering in commercial airlines. He said use that for your next podcast. Well, that's only supposed to be three percent. Other industrial nine percent. Photography negative three. Silverware four. Physical investment seven. Uh, do we notice something missing? Where is military? Where is military if 200 million ounces were needed in 1942? Good point. So take a look at this. This is how they keep it low. This is COMEX market. The green, the red bar represents the four largest commercial bank short positions. The green bar represents the four plus the other four, the top eight. There are eight commercial banks in every one of these green lines that are shorting these commodities. Let's say they are Citi, Bank of America, JP, Goldman, Standard Charter, Deutsche Bank, and HSBC. Now, ask yourself this question, John. In a world where India has bought 700 plus million ounces in the last three years, in a world where China is flying around all around Latin America, buying up unrefined dore and concentrate, paying double what the West will, sending it home to refine it so it doesn't show up in the official numbers of accumulation and or uh, off of an exchange and, and change the price. Why the hell would eight banks be short the largest concentrated short position the COMEX market has ever seen in the history of any commodity ever traded in silver? Why? Why would eight Western banks be shorting the price of silver the way that they are? It's because it is needed to make high-tech weapons. And with all of the military industrials demand these days for very high-tech weaponry, whether it be for our own uses or for the wars that we are funding and or um, involved in all around the world, including the Stinger missiles we've given to the Ukraine, every one of them has silver in them. And so it is the military industrial complex that is stepping on the price of silver to the degree of the largest concentrated short position the world has ever seen. Look at oil right here, hardly mm. short at all. Remember when they shorted it down to negative 40 a barrel? That's mm. the futures market controlling the price, not the underlying commodity. And look at this, of all of the commodities traded, they decide to step on silver. And here is the result, here is the LBMA. Look at the, the silver inventories at the LBMA. They're down to their lowest level, basically, in the 140-year history. Of the 800 million ounces, they hold 500 million belong to uh, the ETFs. That leaves 300 million available. Yet they have admitted, the LBMA admitted, that they are trading um, 292 million ounces a day, just under the 300 million they have every day. Yet they admit those numbers are 10 times understated 
because they only report the final numbers. 10 times, which would mean they're trading almost 3 billion ounces of silver per day on the LBMA, which would be three and a half times annual global mine supply. Only 300 million ounces backing it. The Colmex only has 70 million in the registered category. So 370 million ounces theoretically available for, for sale right now, yet they're just the LBMA is trading 300, three, 3 billion ounces a day. And the Colmex silver is rehypothecated over 1,600%, meaning everyone who has a contract, if 17 or 16 people all stand for delivery, one will get the medal if they're lucky. The other 15 will get force majeure cash settled and the system blows up. This chart right here, and I'll unfollow, I'll unshare now. Um, this chart right there shows that the, these countries are using the suppression of the Western paper market to drain the exchanges. They know exactly what we're doing. And it is the, it's the military industrial complex who is more powerful than the president who wants to continue to fight these wars that needs silver to make these high-tech weapons. And so by, by keeping the price artificially low for all of these years, they have disincentivized the world to accumulate it. But India and China know what we're doing and they're beating us at our own game. It will end poorly. Silver is the most undervalued investment on the planet. And I would tell anyone that it's the opportunity of a generation. And I never sell any of these assets as an investment, but I cannot overlook the potential that, that this offers. It's better than any investment out there. I, I really do believe that. Without question. And thank you so much for sharing the uh, copious amount of information on that PowerPoint so people can get a good visual matrix of where we've been and where we are. The only thing I could add to that, Andy, is that also with silver, in addition to everything you said, we also have to consider you know, manufacturing robotics and AI. It's going to be huge components for silver as well in the new digital age. So all the more reason to precipitate the need for silver, to your point. Um, I think last question for today would be a good one, Andy, would be the following. Um, I think the reason retirees don't invest in gold and silver anymore is because they can't earn an income, income on it like they can typically do with dividend stocks, annuities, CDs, et cetera. The inherent problem with purchasing gold and silver as an investment is it sits there as a store of value. I recently saw a video where Keith Weiner is now offering gold and silver leases and bonds. So rather than just for this to their standpoint, maybe potentially hoping that silver and gold price goes up to keep up with inflation, his company offers a way to earn a 12% return. This seems like a good model and a way for retirees and retail investors to earn an income while holding a stable commodity. Have you heard of this? And if so, what yeah, are your thoughts? I, I need to look more into it because more people have talked about it. I don't know how the hell he's get, giving 12% off a non-interest bearing asset. My initial thought is it, it's too good to be true, but I would have heard something by now if it were, at least I would think. I haven't. It's monetary metals. I can't speak to it. I can't speak to one bad word I've ever heard about him. But I will tell you that it is unusual. I mean, this is the same. I'm not trying to put these two together. It's not fair of me. But when you look at like the Celsius or these crypto exchanges that were paying uh, a, a return, these big, these big premiums for depositing your cryptos or the big fee, in essence, what I believe he's probably doing is leasing the, the metal out, I would think, to some degree. And, and the biggest the biggest hurdle, if that is the case, is what happens if there's an event and you can't get your metal back in time. So, yeah, it does. It, it would be enticing if true. I don't know how you get as high as 12% on something that pays no interest. Uh, it, I need to research it. This is the third time I've heard it today, twice hmm. by other people, and, and now you. That's the truth. And um, I don't know. Every time I've read about it, I get this weird feeling. But like I said... Never heard a bad word about Keith or his company. So please do not take it as I am um, speaking poorly of it. I just can't imagine how the hell he's doing it. And if he is, he's a genius and figured out, uh, you know, figured out a pretty decent plan. So um, the one thing is, is what happens if you want your gold and silver back, you know, because it's it's got to be a bond or a lease of some form um, where there's a time element to it. And in a world that is growing very frightening, you know, Sometimes return on is not as important as return of. And when we talk about, um, you know, gold not earning any interest, it's average 9.9% .9 appreciation per year for the past 25 years. So it is appreciating. It's just not visible. So um, mm -hmm. my initial thought is that is that's not what I would do with my metals. But, you know, I can understand the allure if, if some people would want to do that. And um, 
I would want to know what what my recourse is if I want to get it back sooner. Because if you can't make good on it, you know it's gone. If you can't make good on the payment, uh, if if it is a lease, or what happens if they go bankrupt, or any of these things. So I I don't know. It's intriguing. I'm going to research it, and the next time that we talk, I'll have some info on it because I've been thinking about it most of the day today. Ironically. Well, great. Thank you for that. We appreciate that. And it's just good to kind of uncover these variables as we go along. And I appreciate your transparency uh, to find that out for us and or with us in the process. Well, speaking of precious metals, folks, we are honored and as always to have Miles Franklin as a sponsor and affiliate partner. Um, they've done right by us the entire time. And you're dealing with the horse's mouth right here, Andy, the CEO. So they have our personal stamp of endorsement. If you are looking for precious metals, you're looking to liquidate a 401k or an IRA, or just straighten out and balance or right size your portfolio, they have our personal seal of endorsement. So if you mention my name on our channel, Andy and his team will certainly take very good care of you. I will tell you, Andy, the customers that have bought so far have experienced nothing but professionalism and quality. I haven't heard nary a complaint that I expected to, but it's, it's, you're not only investing in something, folks, that is dire in the backbone of the new and the old financial system, but you have peace of mind with this company. You know you're getting the best pricing. You're getting transparency. You're getting a treasure trove of experience. So we only put our name behind people and, and products and companies in which we wholly invest and believe ourselves. Uh, at the reset process, uh, Andy will tell you I'm going to be investing um, a good portion in these precious metals with him, and I'm entrusting him with our own money. So for whatever that's worth to you, uh, that's our two cents. And then uh, I'll turn it over to Andy. Any final comments and questions and where people can find your work? Yeah, the, the best place to reach out to us is at info at Miles Franklin and just let us know that John Dowling sent you and you'll get a special price list that you won't find on our website that are reserved for your clients, your listeners, uh, as good or better pricing as anywhere in the country. Um, and final words, you know, the, the it just seems things are the quickening, you know, it's the quickening. Things are speeding up and... Mm -hmm. Like I said to you, when we had dinner together, I, I look forward to riding shotgun with you over the next several months as we get closer to the most important election, God willing, we get there that this country's ever had, perhaps to comment on it, to to talk about it, um, and to see all the changes um, as they happen in real time. Because truth of it is, is you're providing more information to the public than the media is and helping people um not just survive this coming calamity, whatever it is, this change, change is never easy, um, but but to also maybe even thrive. And uh, it's my honor to be here with you. Uh, it's my honor and our honor to work with your people. Again, info at Miles Franklin, request the price list, ask for questions on IRAs or anything that you've seen here. All of our people are very sophisticated. Most of them have had distinguished careers on Wall Street or high level uh, graduate degrees from Wharton or Temple University and business administration, a big understanding of, of events, um, reset, uh, economics, political, geopolitical, uh, anything that you have questions on, we'll answer. You just want the price list, let us know. You wanna be contacted, put a phone number down. Uh, John Dowling sent me and it's my honor to be here with you, brother. And I look forward to picking up where we left off real soon. And thank you for trusting me with your listeners. It means a lot. We won't let you or any of you down. Thanks, Andy. We feel the same way with your listeners as well. And, and I know that we've had uh, very glowing uh, reviews since our time together. And I also look forward to not only the continuation of the end of this cycle, us helping each other and our respective audiences cross the finish line together, but where you and I will go as, as friends and brothers on the other side of this is uh things continue to change and send my best to John and your family. Thank and you. we look forward to having you on again soon. Sounds good, my man. You stay well and look forward to that too. You too. Good, sir. Take care. Bye-bye.